this morning. It's good to see so many people here this morning, uh, some, so many smiling faces. But I want to welcome you and thank you for being here with us to worship God this morning, whether you're live or whether you're joining us on YouTube. Uh, we thank you for that. Uh, I want to start this morning about uh, with a story about Buddy. It, there was a rural area a farmer was tending to his horse named Buddy. And along came a stranger who desperately needed the farmer's help. The stranger had lost control of his car and ran it off into a ditch. The stranger asked the farmer if his horse could somehow pull the vehicle out of the ditch for him. And the farmer told him that the vehicle, or he told the farmer that the vehicle was small. The farmer said he would come and bring his horse and take a look, but he couldn't promise if he could help or not because his, his horse might be injured from attempting to pull out the vehicle. Well, the farmer did see that the stranger was correct, that the car was small, so the farmer took a rope, fixed it to his horse, and fixed it to the car, so Buddy would be able to pull the vehicle out of the ditch. The farmer then said, Pull, Casey, pull! But the horse didn't budge. The farmer then said, Bailey, pull! Bailey, pull! Again, the horse didn't move. Then the farmer said, Mandy, pull, pull! And the horse didn't move. And then the farmer said, pull, buddy, pull. And the stranger looked very quizzically because all of a sudden the horse pulled the car out of the ditch. The stranger was very grateful but said, sir, I've got to ask you a question. Why did you call all those other names? The farmer said, well, you see, buddy is blind. And if he thought he was pulling that by himself, he wouldn't have done a thing. But with all that help, he pulled it out. You know, are we sometimes like that? Do we think that we can't do something? Do we maybe need to put the blinders on in life because we know that we have Jesus walking with us day in, day out? He says that he'll be with us. He'll give us the help we need. Whatever he asks of us, he'll provide that help. Maybe we do need those blinders on. Maybe we need to be blind to what people say we can't do and be able to see that we can do what we need to do in Jesus' eyes. As we get started this morning, I do want to read you a couple other cards that we got this morning. And uh, I think this story kind of goes along with some of what uh, this has to do. It says, Dear Mountain View Church of Christ, thank you for uh, paying for, us, for camp for us. It was so fun, and I learned so much. One of my favorite things was the zip line, Daniel Jones. <laughs> dear, Mountain View, dear, dear Mountain View, thank you for sending me to camp. I like the, the swim time. They, uh, they thought... They taught me about the birth of Moses, David Jones. Now, we had some others that were uh, at camp also, but uh, the zip line and being blind to what we can't do, I think, may go along with this. So we've got a short video. Uh, the timing may be off between the two, but we've got a short video of some of the things that they did this past week. So please take a look here and see some of our kids in action at camp. streets to open plains we are under one name no one is lost or goes unseen because we're all loved by our king this is nothing ordinary there is power in the name we carry every nation every tongue
again, we had uh, the Joneses and the Ralstons at camp this past week, and I think it's fantastic after seeing all this stuff that we see that they're all back safe and sound. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> How many of you all were ready to go on the zip line, all right? <laughs> Not me, but uh, I'm glad they had fun. And, uh, you know, it's amazing what we can do when we put our lives in, in God's hands. And uh, so as we begin to uh, start our service this morning, let's go to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day of your creation that you allow us to come together to fellowship and to open up your word to, to learn more about how we can live closer to you, that we can do the things that you would have us to do. Lord, we pray that as we go through the service this morning that, uh, that you would let our hearts be open to receive your word, that our ears may be wide open that we can hear the words that you would have us to hear. Lord, uh, thank you so much for being God and allowing us to be called your children. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to turn it over to Jackson Swain, and he's going to lead us in, uh, in song service this morning. So, Jackson. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of Faith is the Victory. That's in, that's number 727 in the hymn.
reflecting on our walk with the Lord and what he has done for us. So we will sing verses 1 and 4 of hymn number 479, soft and in tender. <coughs> is also called the Lord's Table. In 1 Corinthians 10.21, it says, You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's Table and the Table of Demons. Holy Communion, the cup of blessing. 1 Corinthians 10.21. 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we take a participation in the body of Christ? The Lord's Supper is also called breaking of bread. In Acts 2, 42, it says, We've devoted, they've devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. In the early church, it was also called the Eucharist, or giving of thanks. It was also called, or in Matthew 26, 27, 
He took, then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. And in general, the Latin church called it Mass, a name derived from the formula of transmission. We will now pray. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending your Son to die on that cross for our sins. And we thank you for the relationship that we have with you through him. Father, we just now, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to, uh, to commune with you. And as we, as we take this loaf and we take this juice, we know that it represents the body and the blood that was given for us. Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us. And we just ask all these things this morning in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. This, uh, this time is usually time we spend uh, uh, about our offerings, uh, being part of our worship to God. And uh, while we don't pass a, an offering plate, we do have a, an offertory basket, box, uh, tub, barrel, uh, whatever you want to call it back here in the back. But uh, it's there to drop your offering into. Uh, but as you probably noticed uh, the past little bit, we, we tried to keep you up to date on the, the missionaries and, and the service, services that we support in, in ministry. And uh, we, we hope to do that. We hope that we allow you to see what your offerings do to further God's kingdom. And uh, all that being said, uh, we have an opportunity this morning that uh, we don't often have a lot of times. Most of the time it's secondhand information that you're receiving. But uh, this morning we have Brian and Marie Lankin. Lankin? Lankin. 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 I apologize. My southern draw doesn't get it right all the time. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, but uh, Brian is the director of church relations at Johnson University. He's been doing that since the uh, uh, end of December. December of 2019. Brian has 43 years of ministry experience. And uh, I got to talk to him a little bit this morning, and you know, it, it, it's hard it's hard not to be proud, but he has 36 Timothys uh, in that 46 years. That's 36 Timothys that are out working, spreading God's word throughout the world. 
He received his master's and bachelor's at Johnson Bible College. I, I, I base that on the years of service, on the year. He works for Johnson University now, but he, was, he graduated from Johnson Bible College, uh, even though it's one and the same thing. Uh, I did look on his uh, LinkedIn page trying to get a little information, and uh, uh, he and I kind of got a little laugh out of this, but uh, on, on his page it said that he was a motivational historian. Now, I, I just had to ask, and, but it, it is kind of a little mix-up, but uh, we did get to talk a little bit about history, and he is a historian, uh, has, a, has a fantastic interest in that. Uh, but not only is he good at uh, sharing uh, publicly, speaking in public, but he's also been published in the Christian Standard. Uh, his wife, Marie, works in the advancement. advancement department at Johnson as well. So at this time, since we have an opportunity with Brian here, we've asked him to come and tell us a little bit about uh, Johnson University because that is some, where some of your money supports. So Brian, if I can, I'll have you come up and uh, if you don't want to come up in, in the sand, you're welcome to stand down there. I'll just hand you the mic. I'll, I'll go in just okay. there. That's good. All right. It's been a while since I've been able to sink my toes down into some sand. <laughs> I want to thank you, first of all, thank you so much for the decades of support that you've provided Johnson. As far back as my records go on, on our database, Mountain View Church of Christ has been there for Johnson. Whether it was Johnson Bible College or it was Johnson University, you have been there for us. I was a freshman at Johnson, and I was able to meet a young lady named Robin True and a gentleman named William Butler, and uh, you're not surprised that I was immediately impressed with both of them, and that they have been fine examples of this congregation, not just to Johnson, but to the world, and you have very much, very, quite a bit to be proud of in them and, and uh, and that is, I think that is justified pride. I really do. Now, it's great, what a blessing to see them here this morning. And that's the type of contribution you continue to make in the kingdom of God for Johnson. We are blessed that you funnel some of your funds through to Johnson to keep us going, to keep us training. Our Congregational Ministries degree uh, school, which is our ministers, youth ministers, and, uh, and other st min uh, staff ministers, continues to be our strongest graduate school, followed by our intercultural studies, which is which used to be called missions, is now called intercultural studies. Those are still our two strongest schools of study, and we continue to graduate those uh, students with pride. We continue to produce preachers. We need more preachers. We need more William Butlers. We need more Robin Troops. And so we're looking to you. We are looking to you. Send us more students. You, you send them, we train them. I promise. I promise we will. As you mentioned, the 36 Timothys, all my Timothys have gone through Johnson, whether it was Johnson Bible College or Johnson University. Both my diplomas are Johnson Bible College, and they offered to, I could trade them in. I said, I can't. They said, why not? I said, well, my wife had made a gift to me when I graduated each time. She had them laminated. <laughs> so I, I really can't. They're laminated to pieces of wood. Um, but regardless of the name, whether it's the School of the Evangelist, Johnson Bible College, or Johnson University, I want you to know we continue to train students for the ministry. And we're proud to do it, we're anxious to do it, and we're very, very determined to do that. You live too close not to come see us, okay? GPS works both directions. It got me here, it'll get you there. <laughs> One of my fondest memories of this place is that Marie and I were part of, of Heather Hampton's wedding. We were here, and Marie played the piano for that, and I took part in part of the service when Benick was preaching here. But uh, we are so thrilled to be here. Uh, looks to be a good year. We have come through the COVID well, 
and you'd be so proud of the student body. They modified, they adjusted. It was a very awkward year. When a big part of being in a college environment is having that college experience, and they were not allowed, they only had four students per table in the dining hall, when it was normally seating eight. Can you imagine the energy that they had when eight were the, and they had, so it, it was cut in half, they wore masks constantly, they weren't allowed to go to any of the ball games. Well, think of the energy that the enthusiasm, the campus energy that is generated through those types of athletic activities. Uh, they no banquet. We had one Christmas banquet where they had to do it in shifts in order to spread everybody out, and it was a great experience. But it was so challenging. But the students were marvelous. When they stood up from the table, they immediately put that had the mask on, it was like second nature to them. Pray for the freshmen of this past year, because they're going to come back and we're not going to have to have masks because they're not going to know what to do. <laughs> because their first experience of, of, of university life was that, well, we always wear masks and classes are all spread all over the place. And, uh, so we're really anxious to see what, what a new normal is going to look like. But uh, we, we had a marvelous staff that took care of us on, the, on the, the campus. They were safe. There were some outbreaks that, that were dealt with immediately. And uh, everyone did very, very well. And so we're, we're very... Tommy Smith, President Smith, has been extremely cautious and has, in every situation, has, has chose to err on the side of caution and has been very careful and extremely careful. Some thought to an excess, but he said, I don't want any child on my watch to get, to get sick because of negligence on our part. So uh, you have a lot to be proud of for that, that they have been very, very careful. But uh, we're looking forward to a good year. We're very anxious. What the rumbles I've been getting from churches is, church, from church relations is that uh, uh, moms and dads are very anxious for their students, for their kids to go to college. <laughs> now get out of the house. So if those indications hold true, we're going to have a bumper crop this year. <laughs> but do pray, pray that the Lord sends workers to the field. We need more students. Guys my age are aging out and there's a lot of us there's a lot of us my age that are aging out so more and more churches and more and more missions posts are going to be vacant we need more students so as you pray for Johnson University we appreciate I think you need a bigger offering barrel <laughs> I love that bucket barrel whatever let's go big uh, we do appreciate your support. You have been so faithful. With that support, please pray for more students. If you would, please. Let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, this time we have gathered is to worship you. We've taken a few moments to look at just a corner of kingdom work that you do through Johnson University. Father, the partnership that we share with Mountain View it has been going on for decades, and we're so grateful for that partnership. May this continue as we all look to the commission that you gave us to go into the world. Father, we want to serve you better, and we will give our best for you who gave us your all. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now, since uh, the kiddos have been so patient, I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, now who's, who's leading the uh, Alma? Uh, kids six and under go with Miss Alma, you have been behaved so well. Uh, <laughs> A Asher's not sure about this. He's, yeah, now you can go, buddy. There you go. All right. He's like, I don't know. He's... I tell you, uh, what an honor to hear uh, uh, Brian. Uh, I've been 
see him right at the Knox area ministers meetings. Uh, and I know we're not in Knox County, but hear me out. Uh, they come as far as Morristown and Oak Ridge and, uh, of course, up here from uh, uh, Blunt County. And I, as you well know, my parents and grandparents attended Johnson. And so I'm a little impartial, right? My dad and I, uh, 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 <coughs> yeah, you caught that. Uh, uh, my dad and I graduated together at Johnson. And uh, there's a lot of other good colleges and Bible colleges out there, but Johnson is near and dear to my heart. And here in about a month, I'm going to be wrapping up, Lord willing, wrapping up my master's degree there. And uh, all that means is I'm going to learn how much I don't know. Okay. Well, I'm going to sing a song for us because I said we would do one at the uh, final Sunday of the month. And I don't know what happened to June. June is pretty much gone. And uh, we just were not able to get together the way we had hoped and practiced as a band. So I'm going to just do a little solo for you this morning. Uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, farther along, you know, this morning's message is talking about uh, each and every life and how it matters to God, right? Well, a part of each life mattering to God means that God is delaying his judgment so that more people can come to him. And sometimes we're wondering, well, when is God going to make everything right? Well, I think a lot of that is in his time, in his way, farther along. Tempted and tried, we're all made to wonder why it should be. Then we shall. 
shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. Father along we'll, we'll know all about it. Father along we'll, we'll understand. Everybody else to lunch. Just give me a second. Hold on. Well, as you know, if you look on your bulletin, we've been going through the vision statement that, uh, as a leadership team, elders, deacons, and uh, staff, if you will, we just developed a quick and simple vision statement to help direct us into the future as a church. It's good to be built on a solid foundation, but you also have to keep moving north. You've got to keep moving in the right direction, or else you're not planning for the future. I take that back. You're planning to die. That's what you're doing by default. You're planning to close the doors of the church unless you create vision to keep moving forward. Well, the good news is all the vision we need is contained in the Bible. We don't have to come up with anything new, but we do need to look at the world around us and how much it has changed and continue to point in the right direction. I've asked this question before. Doesn't it seem to you like a lot of stuff has changed in the last year and a half? How about the last five years? We'll do this like an auction. How about the last ten? How about the last twenty, right? We'll go all the way up. Well, we're going to focus on each life this morning. That's the title of the message coming out of uh, the general epistle that in the New Testament, 2 Peter Chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. The vision statement, we're catching up to the vision statement starts building the family of faith by training each life. So we're going to talk about each life. If you're physically able, would you mind standing with me out of respect as we read the Word of God this morning? His Holy Word, that's really all that matters, not what I have to say. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Follow along as I read. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You may be seated as I pray. Lord, you're so good to us. Your love is seen in your people that we get to meet, in your word that reaches out to us and calls to us, instructs us, encourages us, corrects us, and grows us. I pray we hear your words this morning and we hear how all lives matter to you and how all lives should matter to us. Each life matters to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We owe an unimaginable debt to Jesus for our sins. Right? That's a good, cheerful way to start off a service, all right? We've broken God's law. No, no, nobody's perfect, especially me. Just ask my auto insurance company. 
But we've all got this unimaginable death because nobody's perfect. So we're told the wages of sin is what? Death. death. But the gift of God is? Life. All right, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I've got some good news, but before we get to the good news, let's keep talking about the bad news for a second. Uh, who, who remembers Be Kind Rewind? You know what I'm talking about here, right? Okay. Uh, now, I've got a record player in my house, too, all right? We're, we're keeping our kids up with the good technology, the original technology, the OG audio, okay? We're not going to mess around with that. But here, uh, here's a story of a man named Reed Hastings. He had rented a VHS copy of Apollo 13, and he misplaced it, and he returned it, and he got a $40 late fee. You remember paying late fees at Blockbuster? And here's what he said. He said, I remember the fee so vividly because I was so embarrassed about it. That, that was back in the VH, at, at VHS days, and it got me thinking that there's a big market out there. So I started to investigate the idea of how to create a movie rental business by mail. Do you know where this is going? Established in 1997 as Netflix. He started a company that now has over 200 million subscribers and barely surviving off of $25 billion a year. This all began with a $40 debt way back here, embarrassed of owing 40 bucks for some late VHSs. Problem, solution, he now creates an entire new market. Again, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, uh, that we quoted earlier, uh, we quoted in the King James, right? We didn't mess around. Now, I don't use King James very often up here. I'm not against it. I, I just have other translations, I believe, are a little more accurate word-to-word -word on the original translations. But I quote most of my verses I memorized as a kid in the original King James. I think that was the one the Apostle Paul carried around. Okay, I'll stop. For <laughs> well, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the good news. The good news is God is patient for us to come to Him. That's why we might ask the question, how come evil people, wicked people, are getting away with everything? Well, some of that is not entirely true. There are other forms of punishment, and I believe God will bring conviction and things of that nature. But why aren't we experiencing God's judgment the way we want to? Well, number one, we're not God, so let's get over that for a minute. We're not in charge. I like how uh, Francis Chan, a uh, uh, popular preacher, not one I necessarily recommend, but I, I love this statement that he had. Uh, one, at one point, they were trying out some new music in their church, and it was a little more contemporary than some preferred, and somebody came up and said, I did not like the worship today. And Francis said, that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. Anyway, okay, <laughs> Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Peter wrote this letter about 34 years after the Lord had ascended. You remember that? Jesus brings all of his disciples after the resurrection, right? He's been crucified, buried, raised again. He brings them to this mountain and said, Hey, everybody, come here. I've got to say something. They all climb all the way up the mountain, and Jesus says, Go. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Jesus. That's, that's great. But what does he do? He sends them out, and he says, You are to go proclaiming the gospel, baptizing, making believers and disciples of all nations. Starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, under the ends of the earth, and behold, I'm with you always. He sends them out. And here we are, just 34 years later, Peter, one of the original disciples, one of the inner circle of Jesus' original 12 with Peter, James, and John. He's living in a world that's falling apart. There's Jewish revolts. Tens of thousands of Jews are being killed during this time, during 67 AD when this was written. Nero, just a young punk, he was made Caesar when he was 17 years old in Rome. And Rome is oppressing all the areas, including where the Jews live, and including where Jewish Christians live, including where Gentile Christians live. This Nero is oppressing everybody. If you want to look him up, Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. How would you like that name? You can't find those little tag plates in the Walmart bicycle section with Germanicus on it. I tried. <laughs> He was a punk ruler. He was going off on retreats and vacations all the time. They couldn't find him because he was always having a blast on government money. Glad that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> the 
Christians are saying, when's this going to end? When, Nero, when is Nero going to get what he deserves? How, how come all these Roman soldiers who get to shut down our businesses, burn our homes, kill our families, when, when are they going to come to justice? Well, Peter starts out a little bit before the verses we read this morning. If you back up a little bit in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, Peter says, First, I want to remind you that in the last days there will come scoffers who will do every wrong they can think of and laugh at the truth. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. This will be their line of argument. Here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, well, Jesus promised to come back, did he? Well, where is he? He'll never come. Why, as far back as anyone can remember, everything has remained exactly as it was since the first day of creation. He's saying people are going to make fun of you for believing the Bible and for believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he says it's predictable. You know why? Because humanity is predictable. You know why? Because that letter was written... 2,000 years ago, and we are still seeing those things play out in our neighbors, are we not? Nobody in this room is perfect, but all of us, hopefully, the reason we're here is we want to grow closer to God. We believe in Him. We believe in His Word, and I hope we know His Son is our Savior, but Peter's warning, you're always going to run up against this. But here's what's interesting. You know what he said that, that got me? He said, in the last days, He's saying they're in the last days. Jesus, even before he left, says even now you're in the last days. We talk about the last days, I think, because it makes a lot of money selling books. But the fact of the matter is, the last days are the days that come after Jesus has already come on earth. We don't know when judgment actually comes. We don't have, we're not being given that actual information. People who want to sell books and make movies and have podcasts and shows sometimes like to predict and re-predict when the Lord's coming, get everybody excited, disappointed, come up with another day, get everybody excited, disappointed, come up with another day. And here we're told it's going to be a part of life as a believer when you know the truth. Truth is a light and it scatters away what? It scatters away darkness. Basically, Peter's answering the question, are we there yet? The early church is like a bunch of kids in the back seat saying, are we there yet? Now, that's not a bad question, but he's saying, we're going to get there when the time is right. Now, I'm a really compassionate father, so when my kids ask, are we there yet? I say, why does it matter? <laughs> why does it matter? Do you have something you need to do? Give me your calendar. Did you have an appointment that I missed something? I don't care. We're fine. Let's keep going. That's basically what, what the Lord is saying here. He's saying, listen, you're asking if we're there yet. Are we there at judgment yet, Lord? Are we there? And Peter gives a very powerful answer in verse 9. Here's why we're not there yet. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. In other words, we're right on track, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, and here's the big deal, not wanting anyone to perish. Not wanting anyone to perish. Now, I... I if, if, you, if you are a hyper-Calvinist this morning, if you're here, you're listening or watching on YouTube, or, or you're here and you think, I believe God creates a person to be saved, and God creates a person not to be saved. I believe God makes certain people for heaven and makes certain people for hell. Then we're going to disagree because I don't find that in the Bible. What I do find is that he knows who's going to be saved because he's sovereign and mighty and, and omniscient. He, right, on the science, he knows all this stuff. But, here's the deal. He may know who's going to be saved, but we still have to choose him. Because, why? He is willing that none should perish. He doesn't want anybody to die. He's not going to force somebody to be saved, but he's also not going to force somebody out of heaven. He wants all to live, so he keeps waiting, so every tribe, every tongue, every nation comes to him. Each life matters to God, and it should matter to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrates... His own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He made the first move. Isn't that incredible? That's how much we matter to Him. He didn't say, oh, I forgot I'm moving on. Oh, you guys don't. Do you guys hear the brown paper that bad back then? I was told it's not a big deal. I could have been walking around this whole time. <laughs> I see what's going on. Okay. But here's the deal. 
Here's the deal. In our minds, for some reason, we believe in retribution theology. You probably don't use that term every day, but we believe it. We believe sometimes, if I'm good, then God will give me blessing. And if I'm bad, God's going to bring me cursing. Good luck finding that in the Bible, even in what is believed to be the oldest book in the Bible, Job, one of the oldest stories in the Bible. That's one of the first lessons God teaches humanity, is it rains on the just and the what? The unjust. Some of that blessing and cursing stuff, we, we get hyper-focused on it. And I want to put that to the side for a minute and say, each life matters to God. If that life is going through a hard time, that doesn't mean it matters any less to God. And if that life appears to be doing well, I, you notice I emphasize the word appears, italicize, underline, highlight, appears to be doing well, appears to be succeeding. If, if there's a good facade on a life, that also doesn't mean their life matters more. We, we've got it, and I say we because it's a childish thing. We all do. I know we do. We say, well, this person must really be blessed by God. Number one, maybe they're not being blessed by God. Maybe they just gave into the world system. Number two, so what if they're being blessed by God? That doesn't mean they're doing everything right, because God will sometimes still bless those who are, wait for it, human and make mistakes. And God will also put those through trials and testing who are walking with him. That's why Psalm chapter 23, perhaps one of the most well-known psalm, says, and this is a psalmist, uh, David, somebody walking with God, said, even though I walk through the what? The valley of the shadow of death. Not the, not the valley of death, the valley of the shadow of death, right? And what does he say? I will fear no what? Amen. Because I've done everything right. No, what does he say? Because what? Thou art you were with me, thou art with me. It, each life matters to God. Each life matters to God. When, when we're talking about the, the vision of this church, I've just got to say, there, uh, there's a, here's a confession from somebody who grew up in church their entire life, right? In their entire life. Um, matter of fact, as early as I can uh, not even remember, uh, partially because I received my first uh, concussion, I believe, in a church in Kentucky, a Union Christian Church. My parents were going to Johnson, and they would drive about an hour and a half up to preach at Union Christian Church in Kentucky. And it was an old church with a wood floor, and uh, whenever the, there was a choir special, there was only two people left in the congregation. All right, it was, it was a small church. And my mom had one of those, and she told this story on herself, all right? Um, so Brady, we may have to edit this out of YouTube if my mom leaves a nasty comment about me telling this story. But she had me in the little car seat, right? I was the firstborn, so I'm the guinea pig. That's what they always told me. Well, this guinea pig wasn't buckled into his car seat. So she picked up the car seat, and I just do a face walk right there on the old church floor. My parents literally dropped the mic that morning. No, that's terrible. Anyway, but, so, um, Brady, I think that one definitely needs to come off. Anyway, uh, but, but here, here, here's the deal. I've literally been in church. So if you wonder what's wrong with me, that's it. That's one of the many reasons. I've been in church since I was born, and I notice, and I love church people, I've, I've grown up in church, I've had challenges to my faith, and I've stepped away from certain kinds of churches, gone to other kinds of churches, but I've constantly been in the Word, the Word of God, I've constantly been in prayer, and I've grown, and let me tell you this much, church people are terrible at making new relationships. I'm saying that as a church person. We're terrible. Why? Because we're learning to trust other people, so we keep going back to that circle. Whenever Jesus called his disciples up to the mountain, he didn't say, all right, now that you're here, go ahead and build a church building right here and keep gathering here every Sunday. He said, now go. Go. Go spread the news. Please remember that each life is on the line here. Yes, God's being merciful right now. I, I'm... I'm I'm glad we're in a season of grace right now where the gavel of judgment is coming down, but for some reason there's a pause, there's a hesitation, and there's a gap between the table and the gavel through which, and it's the blood of Christ through which we can walk, pass under judgment without being judged. Isn't that wonderful? If you think church people's judgmentalism is bad, and it's bad, it can be if we're not careful, the judgment of Christ is final. If you pass into eternity, if, if you die without knowing Christ as Savior, your destiny is a very literal place called hell, but that's not going to be because God said, did you do good things or bad things? Uh, more bad things than good. We're told in the Bible, there is none good, no, not 
So nobody's ever going to get to heaven or hell that way. All it takes is one sin. So what we need is our names written in the Lamb's book of what? That's what matters. Do you know Christ? Are you covered by His blood? Are you walking with Him? When, when He covers you with His blood, then you are now clean enough for the Holy Spirit to live in you. You can't polish yourself up. I can't polish myself up. There is not a single life on earth that cannot be cleaned up by Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? We need to spread that message this week. Reconsider the neighbor you've disqualified from receiving the forgiveness of Jesus. Reconsider that family member you checked off your list and said, I don't see how they're ever going to open their hearts to God. Reconsider them. Remember that each life matters to God, so it matters to us, right? The next time you're wondering about the timing of God's judgment is the, as all the news alerts come on, and you're like, man, I can't believe how crazy things are. And you're like, when is it finally going to end? Remember, God is delaying that final judgment, if you will. He's delaying that time of reckoning so that people can come to him. So instead of wondering when, start looking around for who. Lord, who do you want me to talk to? Is there a door you want me to knock on again? Is there a person I've not introduced myself to? I need to invite them over for dinner so we can build trust and I can say, hey, it's been good to know you, but I, I, I would like to get to know you more and tell you about what Jesus has done for my life. Reconsider that. That I don't know how long we have, you know, until judgment. I if I if I'm ready, if I, you know, if I really need the money, I'll write a book about when Jesus is coming back. If I get bored like everybody else, but if I'm truthful, I don't know. Jesus said, "No man knows the what, the day or the hour for his return." So we're not worried about that. Basically, the apostle Paul's saying, "Quit worrying about it." I'm sorry, Peter. The apostle Peter's saying, "Quit worrying about it," and focus on reaching out to those who need to be saved. That's our goal. Each life matters to God, so it should matter to us. If Mary and Vivian come forward, we're going to have a time of invitation. And a, a part of this time together, um, I thought I had set one of the things up here. Hang on, wait a minute. So, I have a paper up here that is now missing. Did somebody turn it into a paper airplane? I believe it's Psalm 480. Oh. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm not against you making paper airplanes. I'm just saying make sure they fly well. That's all I'm saying. But as we have this time of invitation, it's also a time of meditation. It's a time for you to just soak in what the Lord has said to you. To just met, absorb it, think about it, pray about it. It, it is also a time uh, where you're invited to come forward. If you're like, I, I, don't, I know I need to do something. I just don't know exactly what it is. We've got uh, Tony uh, is a deacon, Con's an elder, uh, Scott's an elder, Brian's an elder, all up front here. If you want to come up front and talk to anybody up here, all right? Uh, and, and I'm available too, but I'm just saying it doesn't even have to be church leadership, does it? Look for another person following Jesus and get in line behind them. Get in line behind them. Any man or woman of faith who's faithfully following Christ and knows the word, go talk to them, talk to us. Think about what God is calling you to do. We're going to sing the first and the third verse. If you wouldn't mind standing with me, if you're physically able, as we sing our final closing song of invitation. Mm -hmm. 